All right, as we wait for some friends to join us, I just want to remind everyone that um, you are still able to register for our Colorado, Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented conference that we had back in October. Um, that link is still available and live for you on coloradogifted.org so that you can register for that conference and still access all of our great keynotes and speakers. They were all recorded um, so you can still get professional development um, credit and everything for that. If you're still interested, go ahead and go to coloradogifted.org and sign up for our conference. I am here tonight with Mark Smolowitz. Um, he is a director and producer of a film that I am just so excited to see. Um, I think it really speaks to the work that we do in the state of Colorado and across the nation. Um, he is a multi-award winning independent filmmaker based out of San Francisco. He's had three decades of experience in the film and media business. Um, as director, producer, and executive producer, he's been involved in 50 or more independent films um, wearing many hats across the industry. He has, the combined footprint of his work has touched 20, 200 film festivals and markets on five continents. Um, his list of credits include films that have been <clears throat> screened at top tier festivals such as the Sundance Film Festival, uh, but also Berlin, Venice, Chicago, Krakow, Jerusalem, and many, many more. His film is, uh, company is called 13th Gen, and it works with a dynamic range of independent film partners across the globe overseeing financing and production, post-production, marketing, sales, all the, all the aspects of film production. It was founded in 2009, and it's active on uh, 10, to 15, 10 to 15 current projects, independent and inside Hollywood. So Mark is a busy guy, and so we are super duper happy that he is able um, to, to come and talk to us about this film. It's still in, in, um, in, in the works. It's post-production now. Um, it started, looks like he started kind of on it about 2016. Um, so thank you for joining us, Mark, and taking time out of your very, very busy schedule to talk to us about this exciting film that we just cannot wait to see. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, shall I just, you know, kind of say a few things about the G word to start? Absolutely. Great. Um, so um, it's hard to believe, but the very first email in my inbox regarding the G word was actually in 2012, right? So I can, um, so the first email ended in my inbox in 2012 um, and uh, my producer Ron Turiello reached out to me and sort of, he was, he was the seed. He was the person that sort of planted the idea in my brain that, um, that there was something to do here. Um, and it wasn't until 2014 that we actually picked up cameras and actually started filming something. Um, sometimes it takes you know a while to get a movie up and running and to figure out you know sort of the, the business model to kind of you know make it work. Um, but in 2014, I remember in the fall, it was actually in November of 2014. It was exactly six years ago. It was the first the first shoot was November 8th, 2014, and it was a uh, you know wonderful experience. Um, but I actually didn't announce the movie publicly until 2016. Um, and that was, that was actually intentional um, because I was really trying to spend the first couple of years just figuring out what movie do I want to make, right? Um, I, you know, very early on, I, you know, came to understand that uh, the gifted community, if we can call it that, right, or the gifted communities are, um, you know, have been doing this incredible work for, you know, for decades, right? And there was so much backstory that I needed to understand, relationships, stakeholders, you know, who are the players, you know, your organization is a strong example of one. And I needed to know that landscape inside and out, right? I needed to know that I was the right filmmaker to make the movie, and I needed to be super clear on what movie we were trying to make. So when we were ready to go public with it, that it made sense for people, right? That, that this, is, this is something that they wanted to sort of support and that um, had, had buy-in from the core audience. Um, you can't just sort of show up and say, hi, I'm making a movie about gifted. <laughs> you, know, you can't just show up and say, hi, I'm making a movie about anything, right? You have to really do the deep, deep work, right? And sort of show up and show out is how I describe it, right? Really show that you are walking the walk with communities that have, that have been doing this work for a very long time, pre-existing my involvement in, you know, in making this movie. So it was about 2016 that we, you know, we went public and um, I remember it, it, you know, vividly, um, you know, and I think you're going to show that very first video that was the first promo, right? And that piece went viral quickly. 
Um, now, granted, we, you know, we had some organization behind what we were doing. We were prepared to launch. We launched the video, our social channels, and our website all on the same day. Our newsletter signups, everything, it all went live on the same day. It was like, you, you know, we, we, hit, we hit that button and it all went out, right? And it was a remarkable first couple of weeks um, because the video and the video that you'll show, I think it was, it was seen more than 40,000 times on either Facebook or Vimeo. Um, I can't even, you know, I should look and see what the, what the numbers were like, but that, that video was seen widely. And we started hearing from people everywhere um, on our, you know, at our, the movies Gmail or our newsletter signups were coming in from everywhere. And I was getting direct emails from Singapore, Switzerland, you know, Hong Kong, Australia, and of course, all around the United States um, from families, from parents who were struggling with gifted. And so it was so clear that, you know, if they could find us like this new movie that had just launched itself, right, that there was a need for some sort of storytelling in this space that would kind of meet these families and, and parents kind of where they are to support them. Right. Even though there are amazing nonprofits that are that are in, in the field doing the great work, there is something about storytelling that really kind of unleashes a sense of I want to be a part of that. Right. Um, I want to see myself on screen. I want to see my child on screen. I want to I want to understand how I relate to all of this in my experience. Um, so very early, we, you know, I was um, impressed, if not, you know, startled by the amount of interest um, and you know, there were so many, um, some of these emails that came from all around the world were really quite touching. Some of them were um, difficult to read, were quite sad and troubling. And they really highlighted for me, um, the traumatic aspects of the gifted and talented and neurodiverse experience. Um, so parents that really are struggling with their child. Um, and, and because so much of my film work has been about trauma and has been about sort of characters and stories that are in that sort of traumatic space and kind of, you know, seek to be empowered on the other end of that space. Like, you know, that those two things kind of go hand in hand, trauma and empowerment. I was, you know, really early on kind of convinced that I could do some good work here, you know, that there, that the G word enterprise, you know, a documentary and much more um, could, um, add value, right? And that's that's really what um, that that's always been a guiding principle for me as a filmmaker is how can I add, you know, be additive here? Um, how can we differentiate ourselves and and partner and collaborate and extend these stories into you know the mainstream so there's just more awareness and more understanding? So so that's always been sort of the operating principle was you know sort of you know show up do the deep research, do the deep relationship building, build those collaboration networks um, and, and do it again and again and again and again for all the years that it's been going on. Um, so, so in some ways, you know, eight years this has been unfolding um, actively for four and um, I couldn't be more delighted by our, by our progress. Well, and I think you make a really good point about the storytelling and, and you know, advocates like our association and parents um, can say that there's a need as much as they want. We can do the research and publish the, the studies, but I think there's something about the way you bring the stories together and the many facets of giftedness and the way giftedness looks in so many different forms. And I think you, you allow your viewers to kind of live the experience. And, and as somebody who's been working with gifted students for over a decade, I think people have assumptions about what giftedness is. And then until they live with the giftedness and either become an educator of the gifted or have a child that is gifted, there's not a real understanding of, of how truly different that neurodiverse, how neurodiverse those kids are and how much that neurodiversity affects so much more than just their, their, their academic aptitude, you know, but also their, their, their inner selves, um, and the way they interact with the world. And I think you capture that really well um, in, in, the, in the shorts that you've already uh, made available. So mm -hmm. I would love to show the trailer now so that um, our viewers can kind of see what that, what that looks like. And, and then maybe while um, an audience, just so you know, while we're, while we're showing this trailer, please go ahead and feel free in the comments here on Facebook 
to ask some questions. We have some questions already created, but please feel free as they come to you to ask some questions um, as, you're, as you're watching the trailer or viewing some of the other clips. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Fabulous. Get us back to the beginning here. Okay. Gifted children, they're a small percentage of the population. They are unique, they have special needs. You will find gifted individuals in all ethnicities, in all socioeconomic groups. I wasn't very challenged because they were just giving me work that was just like reviewing it what's considered okay behavior, how they're gonna react to the kinds of intensities and sensitivities and issues that these kids have. You put a highly gifted kid in a regular classroom. They already know virtually 80% of what's gonna be taught before they walk in that door the first day of school. I know spelling is important and handwriting, but why don't we use some of the 300 computers we have? This is not just about my kid, this is for this whole subset of kids that need what some people are looking at as special consideration. They really are thinking at a different level. It's the questions they ask, the conclusions they come to, the ethical and moral issues that they have. We had one girl at five years old had a sit down in kindergarten because of what she thought was perceived injustice to another child in the class. It's very difficult, one, to actually know how connected you are and how everything you do impacts everything else in the world, what sort of butterfly effect that uh, everything has. And even harder than that is to actually change the way that you act. When parents go into a school or an environment, very frequently they face backlash as a result of trying to get their child's needs met. What we find is the needs of these individuals, both children and adults, do not get addressed largely because people don't even want to talk about the subject itself. There are some social and emotional problems that come with being highly gifted. You have to be able to get comfortable with the idea that your children are at this school because this is the right educational fit. We need to really talk to educators. We need to talk to everybody we meet about what it means to be gifted and that it does not mean success. If we keep telling these kids, you're so smart, you're gonna change the world, we create anxiety. There can be a really a dark side when it's not identified and not understood. Well, for me, dancing is an escape from the very intense pressure that sometimes comes from school. I put a lot of pressure on myself. But when you're dancing, you can't think about that. If you, because if you think about it, then your dancing suffers. So you have to be able to separate what's going on in your life from what's going on at the studio. From eighth grade onwards, I started having issues. I was depressed in high school pretty much all the time. Like I had a wound, basically. And um, I was trying to hide it. Like mood swings issues with self-harm and suicide, and also anger issues. There's no understanding, so we keep putting them in the wrong situation, and of course that anger is going to boil over. And every time one of these horrible tragedies happen, it's because we have failed this population. We're so thankful every day that we are here because I think in any other environment, it might have been that people looked at my son and said, well, he seems like a bright kid, but can't read. The classes are based on what the child needs to learn. If you're in kindergarten and you are ready for fractions and multiplication or even algebra, you go to that classroom. Coming to Helio, she's just energetic about school every day. She's actually making friends with her classmates. The happiest moment in my life actually occurred probably when I came into the Early Entries program. Qualifying for the Early Entrance program isn't purely about scores or about IQ. It's really about a good fit. They're really looking for the children that want to be there. Then they're looking to see if a child can thrive. There is something really missing from my educational experience. And that was one of the main reasons why I actually came to Eve in the first place, is because I can interact with like-minded peers. I've developed the, the motivation 
to be a physician by meeting with the other students who are also interested in being a doctor. We decided to start this mentoring program where they could come into the hospital and shadow physicians so they could see what it's like to be a doctor on a day-to-day -day basis. I felt that I finally had people who kind of understood me. She's able to kind of look at subtleties within the drawings and really kind of capture that beautifully. Watching the students identify goals that are achievable and going on to achieve them is, is really extraordinary. We are bigoted against our gifted population and do not afford them the same respect that we afford other people who have differences. We need to educate the community. These individuals respond differently. If you give a child the right educational fit, everything gets better. So, so I shall I just kind of riff because I have lots I can say about that. Um, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah. So first of all, it was fun to see that again. I haven't watched it in a few minutes, um, as the kids say. Um, so I I had mentioned in my email exchanges with you all that. Um, so so we have this Vimeo gallery where we are showcasing six shorts, right? And it, actually, this early short is not one of those. Um, and I made that decision, you know, quite a long time ago, because for what it's worth, that that piece, as much as I love it, and I'll talk more about what I love about it, um, it stopped feeling like the movie, right? Um, so the, the longer that I was working on the movie, um, the, the, these shorts started to actually take on their own style, right? I became much more clear about the movie I was trying to make. And um, that had to do with sort of the characters I was selecting, the experts I was selecting, the, um, the tone, the pacing, the editing, the cinematography, right? And so all of that really started to become clear um, a little bit later um, in, in 2017 after this piece was launched, the one that you just shared. Um, and that, that clarity came when I landed on a particular um, sort of driving question that became the center of the entire movie. And that question is probably one that some of your, you know, audience has encountered in our materials before, but it is in the 21st century, who gets to be gifted in America and why, right? So it's the who and the why. And it became a kind of equity question for me, a social justice question. And I became, you know, deeply invested in unpacking what are the diversity and inclusion narratives that are at the heart of giftedness. And um, mostly because diversity and inclusion has been a part of my life's work, you know, since my, you know, very early, you know, early years um, in my career, I was a young activist, you know, that's sort of in my DNA. And so that was the lens that I wanted to bring to this movie about giftedness. And so in this particular piece that you just showed, um, let me kind of unpack some things that are still super relevant, you know, for what is going on in the movie today. Um, number one, uh, we meet Linda Silverman in this video, right? So I mean, those of you who live and work in Colorado, I'm sure know her well and know her organization, the Gifted Development Center. Um, and that was a particularly important breakthrough because Linda was the first significant national expert on giftedness that said yes to being interviewed for the movie. So that was a major win, right? So once I got Linda Silverman, it was sort of a lot easier to get some other folks to sort of take us seriously. So I, you know, when I saw Linda again in person at NAGC in 2018, I gave her a big hug and a big kiss because um, it was a wonderful interview. Um, and I remember it fondly to this day. And, um, you know, we sat down for almost two hours in this really unhurried conversation. And, you know, and she really did articulate in what you just shared, this idea that, that, that gifted populations are a special needs population that is targeted by way of stigma and discrimination. So that was an early thing that I wanted to kind of grab hold of and highlight. Um, and then because I was interested in sort of coming at this from the lens of social justice, I, um, I found a story that is showcased in that video that is still very much a part of this movie. Um, and that story is set in Los Angeles at Cal State Los Angeles at their early entrance program. So for your viewers who are not familiar, so there are some 12 early entrance programs around the country. Um, most of them are quite sort of prestigious schools, right? 
And what by early entrance program, what that means is that they have a, they have a pathway for um, gifted tweens and teens ages 11 to 16 to enter college full time. Okay, and many of them are commuting. They're still living at home with their parents, but then they're commuting up to school and you know participating as a full time student in a university system. Um, now, Cal State LA really piqued my interest because it was not an Ivy League school, right? It was not your sort of you know traditionally high achievement kind of school, right? It was a public university. Um, it was diverse, multicultural, multilingual, um, people of all ages and backgrounds commuting to this campus in the heart of the city. And so these gifted teens, you know, kind of blended in beautifully, right, in this larger school environment. And so if, you know, they were a smart, you know, Muslim girl, like in a class, you know, at a university who happened to be 14 years old, like nobody questioned it. It was just sort of like part of the landscape. And so I thought that was really, really interesting when I went down there to kind of uncover what was going on, like, like what, you know, what's this dynamic all about? And just encountered really diverse kids, you know, really diverse teenagers in this program. And so we spent about four or five days shooting there and you sort of encounter some of these young people in that video. And then over time, what emerged was two of those people who you see are, are Ilan and Church. Um, Ilan is the artist and Church is the one that we, that it talks a lot about, Wax is kind of philosophical about, you know, about life, he has glasses. Um, and um, they went on to actually um, kind of so, so Ilan actually was called Gabby when I met them, and then they uh, underwent, they became, a, uh, they went through gender transition. So they emerged as trans and gender nonconforming over the arc of making this movie. And then Church became their partner, and they became non-binary and started, you know, using the pronoun they, them. And so both Ilan and Church really piqued my interest. Um, and the reason why they did that was because, um, as I was doing deep research around this movie and starting to attend conferences and starting to sort of see what was on people's minds, um, it became apparent that there were a lot of trans and gender nonconforming teens and tweens in the room and parents who were struggling with that in the gifted communities that I was encountering. Um, and then it became so much a part of like my anecdotal knowledge as I was making the movie. And because I am also an advocate of trans kids and trans youth, I couldn't ignore it. And so I had this beautiful story in a lawn in church that was sort of unfolding and I just grabbed at it. So they became the story that was sort of that emerged out of this video that you've watched um, and then, or that we screened. And then a couple, about a year or so after that, I did a dedicated piece about Elan that is also on that Vimeo gallery. So you can sort of see how Elan's transition sort of, you know, fueled their journey. Um, and, you know, and in that story, you know, we're exploring all kinds of interesting topics that have to do with gifted, like gender, um, creativity, the brain, um, and how, how gender and giftedness kind of come together. Um, it's, our, it's a really strong LGBTQ plus story arc. Right, and I'm really proud of it. Um, but it's one of seven stories, right? So we have seven stories across the country. Um, they are a mix of rural, urban, and suburban zip codes by design. Um, and they really try to give you a national snapshot, right? And I chose those seven stories to be what I call exemplar stories, meaning that when you sit down and see the G or when it's done, you know, when you encounter a particular zip code, you know, and a particular story in our film it's gonna feel familiar, you know, if you live in a zip code that's kind of like that, okay? And so these are very exemplar stories in, in every, every sense of that word, right? And I'm, I, I chose them because of their relatability, their strong characters, um, the issues that I'm able to highlight as a result of, you know, spending time with these characters. Um, you know, we land in these people's lives, in their schools, in their communities. It's a very immersive movie. Um, you really will feel like you're hovering over the nation and then you literally like land in a zip code and then the story comes to life. Um, what will stitch all these beautiful stories together are some 40 experts 
that are going to uplift this movie and help us make sense of really big ideas around giftedness and intelligence and neurodiversity, which includes, you know, twice exceptionality and, you know, thrice exceptionality, all the things that you're all thinking about and working on every day in your life and work, you know, in the communities that you serve, we're take we're tackling all those issues in our movie. Um, and many of the experts that all you know and love and adore that maybe even, you know, at your your conferences are, are in this movie. Um, so it was very important to me that the um, gifted and talented landscape was well represented by some of the more established, you know, leaders like like Linda Silverman, Joseph Renzulli, and many many others, and then some of the new young leadership like Colin Seal and you know other emerging talent that are doing amazing things, you know, um, you know on the younger side of the equation. Um, but we're also shoring that up with unexpected um, experts and voices. Um, that I think people will be delighted to encounter because these people are likely gifted and talented themselves, right? And so they help us, uh, they help us tackle big ideas around identity and equity and justice um, in the in the milieu of giftedness. And it's a um, it's a pretty it's a pretty impressive slate. I'm really honored by the folks who've said yes to participate. Yeah, just in the six um, little vignettes that you've you've shared, um, I've it just been, you know you really touched on a lot of the people that I have kind of been watching through my, you know, gifted journey um, and who, whose expertise I call upon, you know, but then also I think it's, it, you have a great point about how you touch on some people who aren't necessarily um, people you might expect. You, you have a Sheldon Whitehouse, he's a Democratic Senator from Rhode Island and he is in it, one of the experts and I thought that was, he has some great points there. Um, and I. I think I'd like to show his clip later on, but I do have a question for you that, you know, I think kind of is a good uh, segue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you talk about all the different lenses um, that, that you want to kind of showcase and, and how you, it's a national story. Mm -hmm. but, and, and you have on your website and people can read this in its entirety, but the impact uh, manifesto um, and one of our, um, executive board members asks, you know, what impacts or understandings or changes do you hope this film will have on its viewers? If you were to say one thing that you hoped, um, one structural or, or, or philosophical or uh, institutional change that would come about because of this, this film, what would that be? Well, it's really hard to land on one specific change, right? And, and that's one of the reasons why we wrote the Impact Manifesto. So for those of you who are watching who haven't encountered it, it's on our website. And we wrote it through a collaborative process with our advisors and partners, right? So, um, and the reason why we wrote it is because, um, so one of, the, one of the ways I refer to myself, in addition to being a filmmaker, I'm also an impact producer. And what impact producer for me means, and what it kind of means in the larger independent film industry, is that we don't just make movies, right? We make movies so we can change hearts and minds about important issues, right? So my goal is to show the movie, but then help and empower the movie to do good work in the communities that have said yes to being portrayed in our movie. Right. So, so the idea is we want to screen the film across all 50 states and have it be relevant um, in local communities. Um, this early on, I leaned into the idea that, that gifted is local and sometimes so local that it's down to the school, <laughs> right? And the principal who says yay or nay to something, right? That's so it's such an important kind of gatekeeper dynamic that we have to, you know, be very real about. Um, when a principal gets it, you know, all bets are on, right? But when a principal doesn't, all bets are off. So it can be very challenging. Um, so through the course of identifying kind of the issues that are in play in Gifted, um, you know, we, you know, no, no one movie can be all things to all people. Like there's no way that the seven stories and the 40 experts that I told you about could actually cover every possible important issue in giftedness, right? So we're gonna do a, you know, ambitious job and try to get a lot in there, but it's really the enterprise around the movie that will support this impact strategy, right? So, so how, what does that look like? Well, that, 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 that looks like li listening to organizations like yours and helping us understand what are the priorities in Colorado, right? And what are the priorities um, in every state? 
Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's deep engagement work. Um, it's, you know, it's about outreach and engagement. Those are the two, two sort of skill sets that, that I bring to, you know, this thing called movie making that is really not just about movie making. It's about, you know, it's about being an activist. It's about changing, about changing the world for the, for the better, right? And I don't think that I should be so arrogant, <laughs> you know, to kind of show up and tell all of you what those changes should be, right? We've been listening. We have been engaging. We have been hearing what are your priorities, right? Um, I think what stands out to me as prominent in all that are the issues around how children are tested and how children are identified, or how children are screened and how children are identified. Um, and I'm, you know, universal screening for giftedness is highlighted significantly in our movie. Um, it is a very hot topic across all 50 states, some more hot than others, but lots of interest in it as being a way for, uh, for us to uncover and discover children who might not normally be identified. Um, and that to me is the core kind of, you know, mission driven aspect of this film, right, is that um, you know, if you are fortunate to be affluent and wealthy and have your child identified at all the best places where a child could be tested for giftedness, you know, that's awesome, right? You know, if, if you are in a school district where there are resources, where there are things that are available to you to help you understand, like, yes, your child is smart. Yes, your child can and should be met, you know, where he, she, or they has potential to be met and let's cultivate that. That should be in every zip code. <laughs> okay, we should be able to discover and uncover, you know, gifted children who are, you know, in poverty or, you know, kids of color or kids of all kinds of intersectional challenges that, you know, that require some care and support through the process of testing and identification, right? And this includes our twice exceptional and neurodiverse, you know, children, right? And when you start to do the math, like when you really do the numbers, like the numbers of students who are not being discovered because of institutional racism or because of stigma or because of lack of access or because they just live in the freaking wrong neighborhood, you know, in, there's huge societal loss, okay, as a result of this dynamic. I have a great clip that kind of touches on that. I'd love to share it. Um, it's from the zip code from the, the one um, zip code eight. 85349, that's San Luis, Arizona. So it's right there at the Mexican border. And the um, director of special projects in there has a really great um, way. He kind of, he shares that so poignantly. And I thought that was so great. It reminds me of Colin Steele when mm -hmm. Colin says, you know, we continue leaving giftedness on the table. And I'm going to start it here at about seven minutes. The world is changing. It's changing in a whole variety of ways. That means that the treasures of this country are being redefined. The population is being redefined. We keep talking about the Latino immigrants, when in reality, I think in Arizona, 85% of Latino children were born here. We're not talking about immigrants. We're talking about the new America. And this is not tomorrow's America. This is today's America. So the G word is, who are we? Who tells us that and how much are we worth? So if we read, look to see who we are, we will discover that these bright minds are the treasure that we're sitting on. So he says these, when he said that, I just got chills, you know, like when we think about the kids that we aren't identifying because our practices and procedures we've been using for years aren't equitable. They're inherent, they have inherent racism within the system. Um, and, and we've just gone by those systems for so long. You mentioned one of your other shorts, Highly Capable. It's a suburban, it, you know, same issue. So we've got a suburban neighborhood and almost all the kids participating in their Highly Capable programs are white kids. And obviously, that's not the reality. As you said in your early entrance program, you said how diverse those children were. And, and we're, you know, we're, Colin Seal says it over, we're leaving giftedness on the table when he says these bright minds are the treasures. And you say in your manifesto, there's a huge vacuum in funding, leadership, legislation, when it comes to meeting the needs of smart children across this nation, especially those in disenfranchised zip codes. And I think that 
when I watched all the different shorts, we talk about Twice Exceptional, you're talking about um, students who are living in San Luis, immigrant children, students, children in poverty, talk about black intelligence. There's a short about black intelligence and how um, in these zip codes where the resources, the, the teacher turnover is insane. We've got more than 20, 30% teacher turnover, low resources, the funding the funding algorithm is, is a mess and these students in low income neighborhoods have low income schools and, and you know, you really touch on all that and it is, it's just how, how are, how can we as advocates uh, lift these inequities and, and, and try to try to figure out a way to find a solution. And I'm hopeful of that. And I appreciate your film for covering all those various facets of the inequities in the system. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, look, th there's, you know, there's no, you know, one solution, right, that we can sort of point to that will fix all this. Um, you know, um, huge aspects of the system are broken. And by the system, I mean the education system um, at large. Um, what I think is so interesting and promising about gifted and talented neurodiverse education and what we're trying to do with this movie is because of our focus on, on equity and our focus on justice, um, we are, it's sort of a window into much bigger issues in the education system at large. Um, you know, the education system is a social contract, right? You know, every child is supposed to have access to a free and appropriate public education in this country. And, you know, but where we miss the mark is like, what is free and appropriate like, look like in poor neighborhoods? Right, and that's a very difficult conversation to have um, because it's complicated. Right, there's all kinds of reasons why you know, you know, certain zip codes are struggling, you know, more than others. Um, but when there, when things start to work, you know, we can start to notice like what was the change that got things in the right direction? Right, what was the thing that you know, sort of allowed for a course correction? Um, in the case of San Luis, which is one of the, which is the second poorest zip code in all of Arizona and is on the US Mexico border, couldn't be more marginalized, couldn't be more rural. You have an entire community that is invested in its kids. I mean, you know, down to the custodian staff at the, you know, at the schools, like are completely invested and excited about like the children being successful academically. Um, so you sort of wrap up these kids in this dynamic and, and there's just like whole cloth buy-in from the mayor on down, you know, and it, it starts to make sense and, and it, you really start to see a sea change in 20 years. So the San Luis story didn't happen overnight. Like it was a, it's a 20 year story, okay? Um, but what's pivotal here is that there, there was there were leaders who got it right and figured out that they had to they had to deal with their students differently and and sort of through their good leadership you know they changed the culture that we would expect to see in a lot of public schools that are in similar zip codes like San Luis and so that's why I fell in love with the story you know because with the San Luis story because everything that the mainstream media tells us about immigrant people, migrant kids, rural people, you know, at the US-Mexico border, you know, in the time of crazy border politics, like this story was defying every assumption and stereotype that is on the books about what this, this community should look like, how they should behave, what success could mean. Like everybody is invested in the success of these kids. And so much so that some of them are going off to places like Duke and Harvard and Columbia. And you know what's then happening? They're coming back <laughs> and they're reinvesting in this community. And they're raising, they're raising their kids in this, in, they're getting married and raising their kids in this community. So it's, an, it's a beautifully virtuous cycle, you know, in this zip code. And that's why I felt like I really want to shine a light on this because it, no one's talking about this. Um, you know, it's, 
again, there's no, there's no one way to fix this. You know, um, you know, we, yes, we need, you know, national strategies. We need leadership that gets it at the national level. We need a federal education system that, you know, that is willing to look itself in the mirror and, and say, you know what, <laughs> we got to do this differently. Um, and I'm hopeful that that's maybe where we may be heading in 2021. But, you know, at the end of the day, like the hard work is like where the rubber meets the road, right? And it's in those zip codes where the local leadership, the local families, the local community has to understand that in order for kids to get over this hump, you know, everybody has to care about that, right? And the other piece of the puzzle is a change in our perception about that dynamic, which is that just because we invest money or time in those poor kids, doesn't mean that those rich kids over here are going to suffer. Okay. We really have to lean into this idea that, you know, it's a cliche, but it's one that I really think can play out well. A rising tide can lift all boats. Okay. And everyone benefits when more people benefit. Right. Okay. I, I wrote here, I said, why do you think giftedness is, off, giftedness is often left out of the funding equation? And I was thinking about, you know, um, when we, when we group gifted kids together, we do special programs for gifted kids. Um, there, there was a recent study published that um, ability grouping actually did not have a negative impact on other students. And, and the idea that raising the standard for the gifted students rather than, uh, you know, that the, the whole deficit mindset, we tend to kind of fall back on education, possibly because of, of, of school accountability. I think that might be a piece of it. Um, but you know, why, why do you think that is? I mean, from your, your research and your conversations, I mean, you obviously talked to some legislators. Why do you think giftedness is left out of the funding equation so often, especially at the federal level? Well, it has a lot to do with that deficit model that you, that you refer to, you know, in, in your question, right? So we, you know, we are a culture that is focused on, on deficits, right? And so, you know, so much of this sort of stereotype of giftedness is tied in with achievement. Right. And, and when we think achievement, we think success. And when we think success, we think those people don't need support. Yeah. Right. And so the sort of nuances of what we know giftedness to really look and feel and smell and taste like, you know, whether it's the social emotional challenges, whether it's the neurodiverse piece, you know, whether it's the stigma that comes with being, you know, smart, like, and how that manifests in a child's daily experience in, in their school you know, is, is a very real and troubling situation, you know, that I, you know, I encountered very, very early on. Um, you know, I, you know, my, my, my introduction to giftedness in the modern sense of like the 20 of 21st century giftedness was really through profoundly gifted, right? The concept of PG kids, right? And, and PG, you know, the PG person, right? The person with the IQ off the charts um, and how that person starts to behave differently, you know, oftentimes, you know, in ways that make their um, their social interactions sort of difficult, right? And and then you know, and that that child might need additional support, just like the special needs kid on the special ed side of the spectrum, right? And for whatever reason, like you know, across the board, you know, even here in liberal California where I live and where I you know you know I'm very proud to be a San Franciscan, um, I had people rolling their eyes at me, right? That this was like you know. And a ridiculous thing to be thinking about, right? Like, and and so you know, the joke I used to tell people was that don't roll your eyes at me. <laughs> like, if you're rolling your eyes at me, like there's something going on there, right? And so, like, the eye roll is a real signal that there's something beneath the surface that is going on that is quite quite interesting. Okay, um, and then as I started to really go deeper with twice exceptionality as a as a sort of a theme in this film which is, it's really a major theme, you know, neurodiversity is in the, the backbone of this movie. Um, you know, I started to notice that what was happening because of 2E was that giftedness was actually having a seat at the table again. And part of the reason why is because 2E is a deficit-based kind of dynamic, right? You're asking people to like lean into the gifts, but you're also asking them to lean into the things that are not gifts, like the, the challenges, the learning challenges, right? When you ask people to think about the challenges, the deficits, like this person isn't good at something over here, you can get them in the room to talk about how can we fix that, right? 
And so 2E helped Gifted get back on the radar again in a way that was never possible before 2E because Gifted over here had a huge marketing problem. <laughs> Gifted over here was wrapped up in elitism. Gifted over here was wrapped up in stereotypes. Gifted over here was just not you know, it needed a it needed a strategist to kind of you know get it get it in front of the you know public and the media in a whole new way, right? And I think that whether we whether we feel comfortable with this or not, you know, two E is kind of like a savior for gifted. You know, whether we feel comfortable that it's a deficit based reason why it's a savior, okay? And I actually think that you know sometimes you just have to be grateful for whatever you know whatever is working in our favor. Um, and the truth is is that for me, the way that I'm addressing it is that I'm treating neurodiversity as a vertical of identity and experience that commands our attention as much as race, as much as gender, as much as sex, as much as zip code, you know, all of these intersectional aspects of human experience in our country are in play in our movie and are in play in our education system, right? If you don't, you know, how can you ignore, like the numbers of kids who are neurodiverse is staggering <laughs> in our schools, yeah. right? And like, I mean, Scott Barry Coffin talks about in our film that just the twice exceptional profile kids, we're probably talking about a half a million students in this country, right? And when you say, and, and that doesn't even, that doesn't even include all the other kind of neurodiverse stuff, right? And many more we're not catching. Right. And if we're not looking for them, we're not going to find them, let alone be able to support them. Yeah. Right. So there's huge numbers. I mean, how would you ever say to, would you ever say to a parent, no, we're not going to think about your child's, you know, race, you know, in the mix here because we don't really care about culture and race. <laughs> right. You would never say that. Like, that's just not even appropriate in the in 21st century America. We live in a diverse nation. Right. Like, so we need to get people comfortable with neurodiversity and it's really quite similar. It's an identity. It, fo it functions like identity. Well, Emily Stone has been commenting a little bit on the thread here and, and she made a really good point. She said, you know, some people in the gifted community are all focused on speed, acceleration, high achievement, that, that stereotypical type A gifted child. But to e kids and kids that are gifted in, in other ways, in art and in music, um, I think yeah, um, Elon is, they are one of the uh, individuals you showcase who's gifted in art. Um, but also when you hear her talk, you can see that, that, that she's got that cognitive diversity. She, her, her, her vocabulary and the way she relates to the world is different. Her, her experience is different. And she says, you know, they just don't fit those high achieving stereotypes. And, and she does when you were talking and you said gifted had kind of a PR problem. And, and it's that, I think it's that word gifted. And I think when you characterize it as neurodiverse, you touch on all the different things that neurodiversity um, does inside the psyche and in our in the intensities, the overexcitabilities, the asynchronicity, the, the, the sensitivities um, and, and those behaviors that kind of overlap with other um, diagnoses. Uh, when you talk about like ADD, ADHD, um, autism spectrum, um, and she says, what term can we use other than gifted? I think, you know, neurodiverse is a great way to coin that. Um, and and the, there's just so many comments going on here. I, think, I hope you can go back and look at this thread. But she does ask a question, what does Mark see as next steps for gifted programming in the U.S.? And, and based, on, based on what you've seen as you've traveled the country, what have you seen that really seems to be working? And you mentioned a couple already, but if there's a, a specific program that you thought really seemed to be effective. Well, you know, I, I look again, I, I think a lot of this is contingent on what, where the local community is at. You know, I'm certainly, you know, someone who believes in sort of, you know, industry standards and sort of, you know, aiming at, you know, best practices and all that good stuff. Um, you mentioned ability cohorts. I mean, that comes up time and again as being like a way to think about how to get kids of different ages into a room where they're actually working at the same level, even if they are seven or 17, <laughs> right? Um, and there's all this kind of concern around like, you know, kids being a different age, so their social emotional development is, at, you know, at a different place. But, you know, maybe it's worth like, you know, experimenting with that, right? To kind of see if there's more win-win that, that is possible, you know, than, than less. Um, you know, my, you know, my sense is that 
you know, good work is being done everywhere. <laughs> you know, there are, I mean, one of the things that keeps me so excited about making this movie is all of the people in these communities that are so passionate about these issues and topics and working with this, these populations, um, you know, from, from children to adults and everything in between. Um, and seeing, you know, the, the kind of commitment, the follow through, the, the, the willingness to sort of, you know, fight the good fight for gifted, right? Um, and, you know, there's obviously like the movie is called the G word for a reason. Like we understood early on that the word gifted, right, was, you know, had all kinds of baggage, <laughs> you know, as a word. Um, it's the, again, that eye roll. You know, um, and so I wanted the G word that was a very intentional title to be able to be kind of like a container of different stories that you might not expect. Um, and so this movie will disarm you with what you, we, you know, what we're going to show you what smart people can look like in this country. You know, and and there are some traditionalists in Gifted that may not love every story because it will not, you know, check all of the sort of like research boxes that they think, you know, constitutes Gifted. And guess what? Go out and make your own movie. <laughs> you know, that's really how I feel about it, right? Like I'm making this one and I've spent, you know, more than six years figuring it out. So uh, send me an email and challenge me if you don't like something that we're doing. Like, that's how I feel about it. You know, it's like, you know, we really have, we have done deep, deep, deep work here, right? And, you know, so it's sort of, you know, I don't claim to, you know, know everything, but man, we're doing our best to, you know, be as inclusive as we can. Um, you know, one of the ways that I, you know, I talk about this movie is that it's like a room, okay? And my interest is in keeping more people in the room than less. Okay, and I think good work and gifted should be similar, right? More people in the room than less, right? So anything that we might say or do that would exclude others isn't really a value proposition that I can get excited about, okay? Um, and if that, you know, if that value proposition for some people looks like my kid is gifted, yours is not, the conversation ends, right? That's just not an interesting conversation to have. And that's not the kind of conversation that storytelling supports. Like what storytelling is about is taking you on a journey to kind of rethink your assumptions, right? And really rethink what you think you already knew about something, right? So if you show up to watch the G, the G word and you, know, you think you know everything because you've been gifted your whole life, well, go out and make a movie and we'll, you know, we can compare notes later, you know? But I, I, my, my gut tells me that we're gonna surprise and delight you um, regardless of where you sit. Um, I hope that's my intention. Um, I also want this movie to be um, as mainstream facing as possible. Like I want it to be a mainstream education film. It's not, it's not just ghettoized over here in like the gifted world. Like I want this movie to mean everything for you and your organization and the people watching and all the stakeholders who are doing good deep work in gifted. And I, that's my hope but I also wanted to move over here into the broader communities, right? And, and kind of address that PR problem, right? Um, so to circle back to your original question, like we all are capable of having our perspective challenged, right? So like lean into that in Gifted and we might be delighted by what child shows up in a classroom that we might not expect. And as you were going through this, Mark, and I sense that you yourself are gifted. <laughs> what um, Nikki Myers asks, and this is probably going to be our last question because we're nearing on six o'clock. Sure. Um, Nikki Myers asks, what part, what aspects of giftedness does Mark identify with himself? Hmm. No, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, I was a gifted kid. You know, I was in a pullout program. I was identified. Um, I went to, you know, public school in the 70s. I know you just can't believe that because, you know, I'm just, you know, look much younger than that. Um, that's my joke all the time. I just turned 52 years old. So this is what 52 looks like, okay? Um, with that, um, you know, my gifted pullout experience was extremely positive, okay? Um, I. I, I did extremely well being put into a room with other smart children and being able to pursue like learning up learning opportunities that met me where I was at. 
Um, and I remember what that felt like. And that was extremely empowering. Um, and so, you know, that aspect of, you know, which, what I, you know, I, I believe that that should be in the public schools, right? For all, all children who are learning, they should be able to be met where they are. So that, you know, and whether that looks like enrichment or acceleration, I'm all in. Um, I know there's a lot of debate around whether enrichment is really for gifted or not. I, 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 I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in like what works for the child. And, um, you know, there were, there were aspects of my education where I was definitely accelerated, you know, and that, and that made sense for me. And there are aspects of my education where, I, where enrichment was the strategy and that worked for me. And I probably was a really interesting blend of those two things, is, is if I could sort of talk about myself that way. Um, and so, you know, much of how we think about our experience really isn't black or white, right? That's why I love the whole non-binary aspects of gender, because I really think that most things in this world are not operating in binaries. It's not enrichment or acceleration, right? more, we're really on a continuum of experience and understanding of these things. And most children are these kind of curated, you know, dynamic beings that need different types of support and opportunities, depending on the subject area. I mean, look, you know, for the record, there are just extremely smart people out there who are going to test off the charts in every subject. That's just, there are just those people exist and they're beautiful and awesome and let's celebrate them too. Um, but I think we live in a much more complicated culture than that, um, where if, and, and so I'm excited by universal screening. I'm excited by ways of identifying kids in, that are, that are dynamic, that are pushing the envelope. But then I also understand that you have to do something with these children once they've been identified, right? And if they go and, and if they're a child of color, and if they're a child of poverty and they go into a classroom where there's only white teachers, you know, there's likely going to be dynamics there that are also challenging, right? If you don't train teachers, you know, on how to be, you know, an, you know anti-racist, <laughs> they're not going to understand the nuances of racism. If you don't train teachers in twice exceptionality, they're not going to understand how to meet the needs of, of twice exceptional students that are, that are doing well over here, but are challenged over here, right? And I think you know the sad hard truth of our country is that we're so quick to see the deficits right and so that's why so many twice exceptional and gifted kids who exhibit you know asynchronous behaviors are put into special ed and are crushed by that yeah. or they're made to feel antisocial and they're crushed by that and that is not acceptable well you i know? think one thing you you do in this film and I think that's, you know, kind of what I took away as I like watched all the shorts, uh, the little vignettes was that it's, it's about the whole person and that includes their culture. Yes. And, and that includes their um, social emotional development. That includes um, their, their feelings. It includes their mental health. That includes their uh, gender identification. Um, that includes, you know, you, you really do a great job of, taking giftedness and all the other spokes that kind of come off of that and, and saying this is all of it you're not just a gifted individual you are you are Elon you are um you know Latino you are children of immigrants you are and you pull that all in in a way I think that addresses all that nuance and I think that's so important when we talk about um social emotional learning and whole child education and you really bring it all in in this story in your stories so I I appreciate whole person educate gift education, Nikki says. I think you really bring everything in and I appreciate what you've had to share tonight. We're gonna have to wrap it up. We're running low on time, but you the questions and the, the comments are just still rolling on here. I think you've really ignited some and piqued some interest. And we hope that in 2022 we're able to um, be in person and, and screen this in a nice big theater with lots of people um, and be able to share it with all of our, our supporters. And, and also, like you said, get it out there to people. And like some of our comments have said, school boards and school districts and superintendents and people who might not always be in our little advocacy echo chamber over here, but get it out and get it to where 
other people can see and, and like I said, live in the stories with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll just leave you with a couple, a couple of final words. So if folks are interested in joining with us, um, we have a wonderful photo sharing campaign called hashtag my gifted story. So I encourage your, uh, your viewers to go to our website, check it out. There's a wonderful way you can submit photographs, you know, it has it, it's all um, wrapped around the kind of zip code theme. And it's really fun. So I encourage people to check that out and submit if you want to be featured on our Instagram or on our other social media channels. Um, and then there's the fact that we're still fundraising, right? So we are, um, we have a, a campaign right now called The Future is Gifted. Um, and we are trying to raise $75,000 by the end of the year, which is quickly evaporating, but here at November 17th, but we're doing well. I think we're at 16 or 17,000 already. So, so if, the, if you've been inspired by, you know, what we've discussed tonight and you're listening or watching out there, um, I encourage you to uh, make a donation at whatever level is meaningful for you. Um, and if you want to do it, um, $52 in honor of my 52nd birthday last week, I'll take your money. So, and with, with, uh, with grace, thank you. Um, but this has been lovely. Thank you so much, Miranda. Yes, I'm, I think, you know, you've inspired a lot of people to, to go into your website and look at all the different stories. And like you said, um, to help get this through post-production and, and so we can all see it. Um, I think go to the website, check it out, contribute, share your gifted story. We'd love to see some Colorado gifted stories on there. Um, we know there are many um, already just here in the, in the feed, we see that. I also, so those of you who are asking a lot about 2E, check out the Exceptional Child vignette on um, the G Word website, but also tune in two weeks from now. Um, we don't have uh, a live the week of Thanksgiving, we're taking that week off, but then we'll be back with Susan Baum. And she was a keynote at CAG-T, um, Mark knows the name. She has a, done a lot of work around twice exceptionality. So if you want to know more or to hear another perspective, please tune in. Um, I think that's December 1st, same time, same place. Also, as we are approaching and, and as we're talking about supporting um, gifted advocacy, Colorado Gives Day is coming up on Tuesday, December 8th. Um, and you can go to coloradogifted.org and see a link there where you can donate to Colorado Gives Day for our nonprofit or to whatever nonprofit um, is, is in your heart. Um, also remember that as you're purchasing your Christmas gifts, uh, smile.amazon.com, you can register for the nonprofit of your choice. Colorado Gifted is one of those options um, when you register. I know that all of my Christmas shopping is done on smile.amazon.com. Um, at least the shopping that I do online. And a portion of those purchases do go back to Colorado Gifted Association um, to help support all the things that we do, bringing you conversations with CAGT, but also our conferences and other resources. So um, Mark, again, thank you so much um, for being here tonight. Audience, thank you so much for um, hanging in through our chat. And uh, we can't wait to screen this film um, in a nice big theater in a couple of years. Thank you so much, Miranda. It was my treat, and I look forward to that as well. Thank you.